Good morning and uh, welcome uh, to Medicine Grand Rounds. So it's uh, my great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, uh, Atul Chad, whom um, you undoubtedly know. So Atul is um, one of our recent recruits in cardiology. He graduated from the University of Pune in India and came to the States where he did his uh, internship in medicine at the University of Massachusetts in Worcester, followed by a residency at the Rush University Medical Center and a fellowship in hypertension at the University of uh, Chicago. Uh, finally, in 2007, he saw the light and he joined the uh, cardiology fellowship program in uh, our division in Louisville. I still remember my interview with him in 2006, uh, where he was describing to me his fantasies to, have, to one day become a, a clinician scientist doing uh, uh, studies of stem cells in uh, cardiology. Uh, he did uh, four years of fellowship two of clinical training and two of uh, research uh, uh, with me in, uh, uh, in the CPU trial as well as in other stem cell studies. And uh, then did one year of uh, training in advanced cardiac imaging at Hopkins with Dr. Lima, came back in 2012, and here he is, an assistant professor in our division. So Atul is one of the superstars in our program in cardiology. He is one of our greatest success stories and one of the people we are most proud of. I am biased because I am his mentor, but even if I look at him from a more objective standpoint, there is no question that he is what we are all about here in cardiology. Uh, he is a clinician scientist. He is the kind of person that we want to produce in our training. He epitomizes what our training program is all about. Uh, when I came in 94, this training program produced pri private practitioners. People came here, got trained, went out, made money, became millionaires, and that was it. That was the end of the story. I changed this so that now almost half of our fellows stay in academia, and as I said, the tool is the poster child for the success of our training program. Let me tell you what this man is doing. So he is a clinical chief of cardiology at Jewish hospital and as such oversees the largest part of our clinical program in cardiology. He runs the prevention clinic. He runs the hypertension program in cardiology. He is developing an advanced cardiac imaging program in cardiology. He is one of the top four RVU producers in the Department of Medicine. So let me repeat this. He is one of the top four RVU producers in the Department of Medicine. So this is a man that uh, walks the walk and talks the talk, as they say, is a doer. Uh, and in addition to all of this, is an outstanding investigator. He, in fact, he has already re risen to a position of national prominence in clinical research. He, uh, he will tell you this in his talk, but <coughs> he's the principal investigator of a trial called uh, Concert uh, HF, studying uh, stem cells in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy. Uh, within the NIH-funded uh, network called CCTRM. Uh, uh, how many of you outside of cardiology, if you're in cardiology, don't raise your hand. How many of you have you heard of this uh, eponym, CCTRM? See, I knew that. Nobody knows about it. So it's amazing. Our greatest success stories in Louisville are our best kept secrets, right? So the CCTRM is an NIH-funded network of seven institutions doing clinical trials, phase one, phase two clinical trials of stem cells in cardiovascular medicine. It is a very prestigious network. There are only seven centers. Stanford is there, Texas South is there, and we are very, very proud to be part of this network. Uh, and as I said, it's funded by the federal government, and we are doing uh, studies of new stem cells in patients with cardiovascular disease. Uh, it is one of the most important, certainly one of the most important clinical research programs in the University of Louisville. A tool has quickly become a leader in this network. He, as I said, is the principal investigator of this trial. He's also running the core for the MRI analysis of all the studies done by CCTRM. 
So it is already well known nationwide as presented at national meeting as published uh, with us in the Lancet in circulation in other journals. Uh, and so uh, in, uh, in a very short time, he has really emerged as one of the new rising stars in cardiovascular medicine, both on the clinical side and on the research side. Again, he epitomizes what we are all about here in cardiology and cannot tell you how proud I am to introduce him this morning as your speaker because he is what I was hoping to produce when we, I came to Louisville as chief of cardiology. Okay, let's uh, uh, listen to his lecture on cardiac imaging, adding mechanistic insight into cardiac regenerative therapies. Thanks. I, uh, I'm not really sure what to do yeah. after that, but um, <laughs> can't thank you enough for that Don't introduction. Care. Well, anyways, let me go ahead and get to the scope of the issue here. We know that about 5.3 million patients uh, currently suffer from heart failure in the U.S. In ischemic cardiomyopathy, what we're really looking at is a scar and a loss of viable tissue. Along with that, the majority of the treatment options that we do have are basically to curtail further progression of that disease. It's not really anything to reverse it. And while these therapies have improved mortality, and it provides, certainly provided symptomatic relief. The question, or really the, the neatest of the issue, and that is that non-viable scar remains, and that continues to be a problem. So what I'm really talking about is a heart that's something that looks something like this. A thinned out wall really doesn't look uh, this area here that I'm really pointing to, and of course the MR imaging that comes along with it, is really an area of the heart that just doesn't look right obviously has um, now been, uh, has had an infarct, uh, really has now irreversible changes. And as you can see here, that the prevalence of heart failure is really astounding. In patients with, uh, who are 80 and above, and as you know, the largest growing population in this country happens to be in this demographic, now has a, if you're a woman, you have an 11.5% chance of having heart failure, while if you're a male, it's say 86 So this is, the burden of disease here is great. And so the onus is on, on us to go ahead and try and find some mechanism by which we can reverse the damage that's occurred from the heart failure. And so here is where we come in with the stem cell story. And the stem cell story thus far is teasing out in the following fashion. We know that stem cell therapy in the myocardial can have one of three major effects. One of them could be that, they, that the cells can differentiate into cardiomyocytes. Number two, that they can go ahead and cause new vessels to, go, to, be, to be created. Or the cells act as very um, strong biologic pockets of, uh, of therapy, which allow um, a, uh, a, a damaged part of the heart um, to now have uh, more biologic effects um, secondary to the paracrine effect of the cell that's subjected to it. So this is a pretty busy slide, but I do want to go ahead and highlight what I think is um, probably the overriding story on the stem cell uh, picture. This is an analysis that was done uh, by uh, Dr. Don's group at the, in Kansas, and it's a more recent one, but really looking at all the bone marrow studies to date, which are using bo uh, bone marrow-derived stem cells for the treatment of heart failure. And what we realize now is that, at least from the meta-analysis, is that there is a good signal here that favors for, um, um, uh, for uh, therapy. And here, uh, what we're looking at is uh, the change in ejection fraction. And here, what we're seeing is regression in scar tissue in grams. So clearly, there seems to be some signal here. There's this, a pretty exhaustively done meta-analysis, but there are limitations to what we've been able to do. And, and as a result of it, we have a great deal of work to do to really tease out the, the signal that we're getting. And part of the issue is really the underlying issue with all these trials is the issue of heterogeneity. And we know that each one of these, first of all, the population is heterogeneous. So we really don't know what, what there's no standardization there. Disease states are not equal in each of the trials. There are different cell types, different cell doses. Um, so there's a great deal of issues there. And of course, there's different modes of de delivery as well. But for my focus in this field, to me, one of the greater issues that really needs to be teased out is this issues of imaging modalities. As I'm going to show you throughout this talk, that there's been differences in the modalities that have been used across the board. So as a result of that, it's been very difficult for us to really garner an idea of the signal of what this is telling us. 
And my press for, for going forward is that there be standardization of this in order for us to really get a sense of what these therapies have in store for us. So to, to really go over the objectives of the talk is to first of all delineate the modalities that are employed in the study uh, of looking at the effects of stem cells. Number two, to go ahead and take a look at the parameters that are measured and to highlight the methodologic differences in how these individual parameters are, are also measured, to summarize these data, and of course to offer some speculative viewpoint as to sort of get a sense of what we're getting from this imaging, what that is telling us about the biological effect of the cells, and whether we can actually exploit those mechanisms to make this even more efficacious. So question one that I have going forward is number one, the cellular uh, therapy increase myocardial function. The question that number two that I have is whether the therapy actually causes any reverse reversal of adverse LV remodeling. And of course, question three is whether or not we actually see a regression in SCAR, and more specifically, is there an increase in viability, which is really the most direct um, parameter that I can think of that would really give us an idea of whether or not there's regeneration. So there's a multitude of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, modalities that are used specifically for assessing myocardial function. I'm going to go over these and I'm going to uh, very briefly and tell you, and I think very soon you'll come to realize that what the problem is in allowing the scientific community to come up with one binding consensus on this issue. So the very first studies that were done, were done uh, to go ahead and uh, evaluate for LV function, were done using LVGram. Um, this includes repair AMI and top care. Of course, um, uh, this is done, as you may know, injecting 30 to 40 ml of contrast and allowing imaging to occur over three to four seconds. Um, and this has been practiced for 50 years, so there's not a whole lot of reinventing of this wheel. The strength of it is that it's easily accessible, it's quick, it's not exactly technologically um, intensive in any way. But the problem is it's not very reproducible, and there's a lack of multiple views. You have at least one, if not maybe two views of the LV, so you're really getting a fairly um, uh, La really sort of um, lack of data to really get a sense of what the LV is doing. And of course it requires contrast, which is a problem. And as you can see here, the reproducibility of ejection fraction versus EF uh, by, by echo um, is not very good at all. In other words, there's uh, a great deal of splay when it comes to um, the concordance of, of, this, of the results that we get from, uh, from ventricular grams versus ejection fractions from echocardiography. 2D echocardiography, surprisingly, has only been used as an adjunct in stem cell therapies um, studies. Um, it was used in top care, it was used in a STEMI, it was used in MAGIC. But most investigators actually went ahead and went to cardiac MR as their sort of gold standard, probably because this modality gives you so much in one shot. 3D echocardiography has a lot of, um, a, a great deal of promise. Um, because it really does have very good data to support the fact that the, that the numbers that we get from 3D echocardiography are pretty um, uh, in line with what we get with cardiac MR. The problem, of course, is that there's always going to be the same limitations that we see with 2D echocardiography. So all those issues that we have regarding um, body habitus, patients with COPD, uh, patients that are just difficult to image for one reason or another, um, will have um, things with 3D echo we're not going to be at all um, isolated in that, in that reason, uh, for, for in that, with that problem, that both of them will have, uh, be subject to the same uh, technical limitations that we see with 2D echocardiography. But what's kind of nice about it, as you can see here, is that you can get very nice segmental um, uh, data, and you can get a real sense of not only, uh, as you can see, just what the contraction at all, but you can also get a nice sense of, if you can see here, and if you lead your eyes to maybe the tip and the base here, you also get a sense of how the LV um, uh, sort of uh, deforms. In other words, you see a the, the clockwise turn here, the counterclockwise turn here. So you have a whole lot of data that can be gleaned from these 3D images. And Scipio was, to date, the only trial thus far that really did employ 3D echocardiography and used it as a very strong endpoint. And as you can see here, this is the data that was in the Lancet study. Um, so this is a little bit outdated, but still worth taking a look at. Uh, is that we did see a very dramatic increase in the ejection fraction um, uh, post at four and 12 months infusion, and of course that saw a statistical rise over time, whereas we did not see anything of that sort in the control group. 
We've already talked a little about the advantages and disadvantages of echocardiography, but the long story short, one of the things that I will have to tell you about 3D echocardiography is that there's still a lot of centers out there that are not well versed in, 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 the, uh, in the modality. Um, so for us, uh, particularly, um, we're, we're sort of ahead of the bell curve in many ways in that we, I think that our, our prowess with the modality is actually um, certainly above the national standards, even at uh, tertiary care centers. And this sort of graph just sort of tells you a little bit about what 3D echocardiography um, does in concordance to, with uh, ejection fractions that are derived from, the, from MRI. As you can see here, there's pretty good agreement. The problem always with echocardiography is this, is that you have a pretty wide confidence it's infidel. And that always ends up being a little bit of a problem, especially if you're looking at the, and seeing if your stem cells are actually making a difference or not. Um, this is not only a conundrum when it comes to sort of gauging efficacy, but statistically it can be a nightmare as well, because you probably need pretty large studies to overcome this problem with confidence interval. What we also saw in our study with Scipio was that we saw that there was very nice concordance between the um, ejection fraction by 3D echocardiography and MRI. And this is kind of an important topic because in general, when people study um, the diagnostic um, assessment of ejection fraction, it's usually done in pretty, pretty um, healthy volunteers. In sicker patients, this becomes a little bit more difficult. So here what we're seeing is pretty good concordance. So now cardiac MR is considered the gold standard in cardiac stem cell therapy to go ahead and assess the multiple parameters, including the function, the viability, and perfusion. And in the Scipio trial, a concentrated effort was made um, to make sure that we can get a, a, a data set that actually used um, good uh, sound post-processing tools to be able to get more imaging. And here's a nice index case for you. On the left here, I'm going to go ahead and show you a pre-stem um, uh, cell uh, patient here post. And as you can see here, uh, when it comes to the lateral and inferior wall, you're seeing a lot more vigorous uh, contraction here. And perhaps with the mesh um, here with the reconstruction, I, I would go ahead and ask you to keep your eyes here on the base of the lateral wall. And here, as you can see here, there's really a significant difference in what we're seeing pre and post therapy. Um, and that uh, has been um, uh, sort of the, uh, again, the, uh, the bottom line when it comes down to what we saw. So in terms of the global ejection fraction with Scipio we, um, uh, by MRI, our trends were very similar to what we saw in the uh, 3D echocardiography where we saw a dramatic increase in the ejection fraction at 4 and 12 months. And here, this is sort of your delta change of 7.7 .7 absolute units at four months and approximately 13.6 uh, at 12 months. What we're also seeing, and this is what we're, we're seeing this both from a global standpoint and a, and a regional standpoint, so this will get me the mechanistic uh, rule number one, is repair AMI was one of the more successful bone marrow studies that were done to date. And the reason that was, was really what really rolled those numbers really well was the idea that if we dichotomize patients to having an EF of less than 49% and greater than 49%, what you're really seeing is that the greater difference really was driven by this patient, these patients who had lower ejection fractions. So this leads us to perhaps hypothesizing a little bit greater, a little bit more in detail. Could it be possible that stem cell therapy in general is really going to be more pronounced in those patients who really need it? Could it be possible that the biologic factors that are required for the stem cells to really take effect really work better in a sicker milieu or in a, in a heart that has more fibrosis and more scar tissue and perhaps more chemotactic agents to go ahead and allow those cells to exert their activity? That's what remains to be seen, and this is where imaging is helping us. So using, um, again, more semi-automated methods, we're able to also get what we call regional ejection fractions. In other words, taking a look at what each one of the segments of the heart does and attribute what we call a regional ejection fraction, just like we would with a global ejection fraction. So the numbers that you're going to see here should equal what we see normally with a, with a total ejection fraction, except they're only dedicated to that one little segment, if you will. So the segments are based in a 16-segment model, as you can see here. And based on that, if we go ahead and take a look at the ejection fraction, the regional ejection fraction in infarct territories after treatment with, with, with stem cells, what we're seeing is a fairly dramatic increase in that, in, that, um, in, that, uh, in that regional ejection fraction. And of course here, um, the same thing um, uh, here as well at 12 months, where you're seeing, again, a very uh, dramatic increase as well. 
So putting all this together, if you go ahead and just isolate the least functional segment, which I mind you was not always been in that sort of traded ter um, in that treated territory, what we're seeing is an extremely dramatic effect of increase of 25.6 percent in uh, at four months and 40.2 percent. I mean, this is a pretty dramatic increase in that regional area. If we were to go ahead and go one step further and say, okay, fine and dandy, this is all ejection fraction, and for clinical use, ejection fraction is great, but if you're really trying to get a signal, you'd probably want something more sensitive than what we, that ejection fraction has to offer. And some of this is actually has to do with the strain. Strain is nothing more than the change of the myocardial fiber length over time at end systole and, and uh, uh, systole compared to its original length in the relaxed state at end diastole. And there are many ways in which this can be all looked at. The heart has multiple ways in which it contracts. It's not just this issue of the heart pumps like this. The heart has um, uh, clock counterclockwise um, uh, uh, motions. It has um, a, a contraction that allows the base to go down to the apex with each contraction. The heart contracts in a radial fashion. And of course, it has a circumferential um, uh, event uh, as well. When the, heart, when the heart pumps, it has um, the circumferential fibers get shortened upon themselves as well. So this is a fairly complex um, a symphony of, of cardiac event or um, motions that have to occur simultaneously for one, for one cardiac cycle. The reason why this all occurs, or at least the biomechanical reasoning behind all this, is because if, with these sort of multiple vectors of motion, it allows the heart to pump very, very efficiently. For instance, if I were to just take the torsion away, in other words, this idea that the heart rings like a, uh, like a, a wet towel, if you will, if you were to just take that away, then the efficiency of the heart actually decreases by about 40 percent, and your ejection fraction drops about 12 percent just from loss of lock of torsion. Um, so this is a pretty important issue. And the way we actually gauge this is, is using um, tagged imaging, or one of the ways we can potentially do this is using tagged imaging and MRI, which is where we take these tags, and the tags allow us to go ahead and take a look at where each part of that heart functions. And not only are we seeing just a general contraction at the radial section, but we're also seeing the twist of the heart, we're also seeing um, how much the, the fibers can shorten, so this gives us a whole lot of information. Tag imaging can be somewhat difficult at times, and so now we have newer methods by which we can do this without having tagging required. And this is a software package that we developed at Hopkins uh, along with our team, uh, use it with Toshiba being the proprietor of it all. And it allows us to go ahead, and we had a, a great deal of input in this. But what it does is rather than having to st stick onto tags, it actually sticks onto pixels of what the image is. And as a result of it, we get these very nice sort of strain patterns that we can see here. We can gauge uh, radial and circumferential strain. And here we're really looking more at longitudinal strain on those two. And so putting that together, knowing that these indices are more sensitive, our colleagues over at University of Miami, Josh Hare's group, has now been the first one to really look at strain. Uh, and as you can see here in his most recent um, study that was now uh, released with AHA this year, he actually did a very nice job looking at circumferential strain here. And in circumferential strain, he saw a nice change um, uh, at, from baseline three months, six months, and 12 months versus uh, in his MSCs versus patients who were treated with bone marrow and with placebo. As you can see here, circumferential strain is going to go in a negative um, uh, um, direction because the fibers shorten. And the greater shortening you have, the more circumferential strain you'll get. So the interesting thing is, of course, when we looked at our Scipio data and we looked at the correlation between baseline regional non-viability and the change in regional EF, what we're getting is a weak but, but certainly statistically significant signal that's telling us that it's precisely those areas that were non-viable that had more of the change in the regional ejection fraction. So that leads me to, to, to point number one when it comes to what we think about the mechanism of stem cells is that when the going gets rough, the tough get going. In other words, the effects exerted on global function by bone marrow nuclear cells and CSCs in the setting of an acute or chronic influx seems to be more pronounced in patients with lower EFs. And moreover, that same uh, dictum seems to really um, relegate what's happening at a regional and maybe even at a fiber level. So that's mechanism number one. Question number two is this issue of volume changes in the LV architecture. We know that as the uh, as with, with chronic ischemia and chronic is, uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy, there's going to be very significant changes in uh, what happens to the 
and to the LV shape. And much of that is, is, um, uh, is regulated by the MMP, uh, TIMP, or the metal uh, uh, um, uh, matrix proteins that will really sort of be the governing factors as to how this all happens. And so stem cell researchers have done a fairly good job of looking at what happens to left ventricular um, volumes uh, before and after um, a stem cell therapy. However, the big problem that's been, that's as a result of it, and what we're again left with the conundrum of what are we going to do with this data, is very simple. Is that if you have a 10 ml change, uh, you know, uh, if, a, if a patient who looks like this versus a 10 ml change in a patient who looks like this, 10 ml change for her is going to be a much bigger difference than, a, than, than for him. Uh, for him, of course, it's going to be a pretty big change. But let's leave him out of the picture for now. So clearly what happens is we go through the process of tilated cardiomyopathy. We're really seeing this nice bullet-shaped left ventricle now go into this more dilated, thinned-out um, muscle. And really, what we're really seeing is the change of a soccer ball into a football. So would it be possible then, could we actually, rather than just looking at, um, at just the issue of volumes or the issue of ejection fraction, could this change in geometry actually help? And again, Josh Hare's team has done a very nice job in looking at this, and actually this is something we're implementing with our New York studies, is actually looking at a sphericity index. Whereas you assume that the left ventricle is a sphere, and the less that it matches up to the dimensions of the sphere, the better you'll be. And that's really where we're getting with the geometry of this. And while it's not studied optimally, there seems to be some evidence that um, there's geometric changes with stem cell therapy. And these changes are most likely exerted due to the molecular um, mechanisms that allow the extracellular matrix to stay intact. And that's our mechanistic clue number two with stem cells, is that there certainly seems to be some signal here. Question number three is perhaps the one that I've been working most on, and it's the issue of infarct size and viability. And really, um, the reduction in, in, in scar size and, and an increase in viability continues to sort of be the holy grail. Because what it really is happening is that you're really taking dead tissue and you're making it back alive again, or you're giving, or what you're seeing at least by imaging really seems to suggest that. And so there's many ways in which this can be done. There's the butamine stress echo, which is a way, which is a crude way of doing viability, particularly with low dosing, SPECT, PET, cardiac CT, and of course, contrast induced, uh, or contrast enhanced, I should say, cardiac MR. SPEC studies actually did um, end up being um, uh, used in the earlier iterations of the trials. The problem with it, of course, is that it has pretty low sensitivity, and as a result of it, the modality fell out of favor. I can tell you from our own experience that it, has not, it was not very fruitful, um, given the fact that these are sicker hearts, there's always a lot of artifact, and many of, much of the image quality has been um, degraded as a result of it. And so this is an example of why um, SPECT may actually not be um, your best um, place to look if you're really looking for viability in, in, in scar size. This is a very nice study back done in, back in 2003, which looks at thallium studies at rest. And as you can see here, if you just look at the thallium studies, you could probably walk away thinking this patient's doing just fine and they can go ahead and do what they want, which probably they could. But if you really look at the, the, the studies with MR, you can see here that there's nice rims here of subendocardial infarct. So really, there is some damage here, but the, the spec isn't able to pick it up. As a result of it, it may be best to go ahead and stay away from it, particularly when you're trying to gauge changes with stem cell therapy. So these are the sort of things, and, and if you can un understand that some of the earlier studies were marred by, by these large amounts of data that were done by spec, you can understand how that's going to give you more of a negative signal because you have burden there. Now, PET imaging has a little bit of a greater chance. The reason being it has higher resolution and it has lower scan times, and as a result of it, you're increasing the spatial resolution and the temporal resolution um, and making this modality probably a little bit more suitable for stem cell studies. And the nice thing about it is that you can have a metabolically active agent, which also allows for better assessment of viability as well. As you can see here, this is a nice little example of what's going on here apically, where you have lack of uh, um, viability there. And again, to go ahead and show you what's been going on. This is sort of a nice compendium of, of, of the studies that have been done. All different techniques, are all and, and of course, all, you know, techniques have been different, and, and, and follow-up times have been different. I mean, we, we're looking at a whole lot of heterogeneity here, and as a result of that, it's been difficult, again, to get a true over... I mean, I think it, 
while meta-analyses really do suggest a benefit, you're always going to have this debate back and forth. And much of this has to do with, I believe, the imaging parameters. So cardiac MR ends up being a gold standard for spark quantification in the current era. It's based upon the uptake of gadolinium into areas of the myocardium. So let me go ahead and just give you this really, really complicated uh, <laughs> um, cartoon that I came up with. This is my more normal myocardium here, and this is infarcted myocardium. Gadolinium, which is the uh, contrast that is used here, is very inert. It's going to go where there's space. So as you can see here in an infarcted myocardium where you do see some, some cells, but they're obviously damaged, or what we're seeing is some fibrotic tissue, what you'll see is that with delay with gadolinium, this is obviously going to stay the same, and here we're going to see complete whiteout of that, of that infarct. And to make, this a little, to make this idea a little bit clearer, that you're going to see gadolinium uptake in both the acute setting and in the scar setting. Because in the acute setting, you have a damage of the cell membrane, which will allow for the contrast to enter the cell. And in the scar, because there's fibrotic um, changes there, leaving a pretty loose matrix of, of tissue in the myocardium, you'll have very nice um, placement or allow, allows a lot more gadolinium to enter that, that area, given the fact there's just more space there. It's not as easy to say that, okay, you see the white area and you see the white signal and that's it, you're pretty much done. There's a whole lot of other stuff that goes along with it. So here's sort of your core infarct, which is what I was referring to before. Not only is there a core infarct, but within the core infarct, particularly in larger infarcts that are sort of more deep set, you're going to see this phenomenon of microvascular obstruction, meaning that gadolinium can't get in there because there, there's micro, the microvasculature is completely degenerated as a result of the damage. That portends usually a pretty bad prognosis, both in the acute and chronic setting. So it's sort of an interesting thing that will obviously need to be teased out a little bit more and a phenomenon that needs to be tracked a little bit more aggressively when we're looking at MR images with stem cell therapy. The other issue is this very interesting gray rim that I'm going to talk about, and that's a peripheral zone. That's a zone that's sort of neither, if you are all um, Princess Bride fans, that's the area that's a little dead. That's the area that's saying that it has a lower intensity than the infarct, but has a damaged myocardium um, nonetheless. So it's an area that really has some um, uh, possibilities. Um, the area that's at risk is really best gauged by T2-weighted imaging, but the long and the short of it, it's really the area that's really supplied by the culprit vessel that you're trying to supply, that you're trying to study. So if you're seeing LED lesion go down, of course you're going to see some infarct, but of course the area that's also supplied by the whole region is going to have some minimal changes, and that's going to be dictated by, this, by the T2 changes, which is known as area at risk, which is nothing more than saying that the area that you're going to see is going to have some edematous changes. So it'll be a little bit of change. And I think that's about it. So now the question arises, and this is where I think, this is where we are trying to redefine how we're going to do this with stem cell studies, is that for whatever reason, for a long time, the MR world lived in a vacuum outside of the stem cell world. In other words, stem cell studies didn't use the same rigorous um, methodology that was used um, uh, in, the, uh, in the imaging world. And so, let me ask you a question for all of you. I mean, you can see that this is white, and you can see that this is black, but if you can look pretty closely, and even in this sort of really large picture, you can actually see that you're not exactly seeing, it's not exactly a white and black picture. There's some areas, shades of gray here. So the question is, what's really dead and what's really alive? In other words, what's scar and what's not? And that's going to be based upon what you use as your thresholds. So if you use your threshold that's going to be more sensitive or you're going to use a threshold that's more specific, that could change your, your you, that could dramatically change the effects of what you're seeing. So if you're going to have different thresholds for different studies, then you're going to have a real problem in trying to standardize all this. So let's put this all together. If I were to go ahead and, um, and let me just go through a, a what we normally do in one of these situations. So you know kind of what, kind of know what we sort of what happens in those dark rooms when we're reading these things. So let's go ahead and this is obviously an infarct here, and you say to yourself, okay, fine. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the area that I think is first. I'm going to go ahead and rather before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and um, draw my endocardial and epicardial borders, just so that I know and I'm telling the the, uh, the computer that this is where the myocardium is. This right here is pericardium, so don't worry about that. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and take the area that I think is the most intense, and then I'm going to take a larger area that I think represents the normal area. So now, based upon these two areas, now I know what my dark, what my really, my, my lightest point is, or really the most, what the intensity of the most damaged point is, versus the area that seems to be the least damaged. 
And as a result of that, now, whether the, now if I go ahead and set different thresholds, and I'll tell you more about that, I can now know what the core is, which is this pink area, and what the gray zone is, which is this. Now notice, there's a whole lot of garbage that came up too. There was a, you know, here it's telling me that there's scar, which it probably isn't, and it's telling me that there's a whole gray area as well, but that doesn't make sense because there's no infarct tissue there, so gray zone can't really um, be in an area which has uh, no infarct, so we gotta now clean this up. As you can see, this is pretty subjective. It's, you know, this can actually be, this is not as, as black and white as you can um, sort of imagine. So, there, so now what I'm trying to sort of impress upon you is that there has to be some degree of meticulousness that has to come to this. There has to be some protocolization of this whole process. And of course, there has to be more standardization of this for us to really understand what's going on with these stem cells and whether or not we're going to continue to, to, to forge ahead or do we just go ahead and, you know, play volleyball. I don't know. So anyways, the other way that, we, now that's of course using a semi-automated um, process. Now, we can also do this using our, our, our naked eye. In other words, saying to ourselves, look, to me this looks like infarct, so I'm just going to go ahead and draw this out and that's going to be manual delineation. And as you can see here, there can be differences, major differences. And this is the sort of result that we come up with at the end of it. We see that there's um, these sort of um, numbers that come up with. We come up with a total mass. We come up with how much of that is infarct, how much of that is gray zone. And as a result of it, we come up with these very, very sensitive numbers. Putting all this together, now I keep ta talking about thresholds. So what does he mean by that? Let's go ahead and take all those intensities that I was talking about. Right? Remember I talked about that really bright image, that really bright pixel, and then I took a talked about the, sort of that normal pixel. And I go ahead and graph it out, okay? If I go ahead and just use a standard deviation method, I'm just going to go ahead and say, look, I'm going to take the mean of this entire thing, and I'm going to say to myself, okay, whatever's above two, three, four, five, six standard deviations from the mean is what I'm going to consider to be infarct. That's one way of doing it, but of course, that becomes a little bit problematic, particularly if you're going to have a whole lot of gray. In other words, if you have some imaging problems in which the myocardium is not exactly all black, this can be a little bit of a problem. The other way that we can do this is called the full width half maximum load. Value. And so let me go ahead and change, this is the intensity here on the x-axis. Let's go ahead and change this over to the y-axis, if you will. If I go ahead and plot out all the intensities over, um, uh, over uh, from the highest to the lowest, what I could do, very simply, is go ahead and take the half of this, and so this is called the full width half maximum method, in which all of those intensities that are 50% or more of, of, from the, 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 the apex of what I'm seeing as my high number, now this allows me probably a little bit better chance of getting a sense of what's going on with the entire myocardium. And I know this is a little wonky. It's a little bit imaging nerdy. But at the same time, I'm trying to, again, come up with this sort of, just try to, again, come up with a binding idea that these real, while they seem sort of minor in this situation, we're talking about grams of tissue when it comes to changes in, 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 in scar size. If we don't do this the right way, we're not going to get the answer that we want or need in this situation, which is to actually get a sense of whether or not this therapy works or not. And so with our, with our Scipio um, uh, sub-study that we did in the MR, we were the first um, group to really report two different methods of how to do this. We came up with different results. We were, we were confident because both of the results or both methods showed similar trends, but we did see some minor differences. So going back to perhaps the older data, the onus now is on us is to potentially go back to some of those old images and really come back to those and say, well, if we use the same rigorous methods that we now know need to be used to actually get your, get, to actually get answers, maybe we could actually redefine this field. We can find out perhaps more definitively, one way or another, whether we actually have a signal here or not. Again, uh, this is again the same situation, uh, and again to to really on it, no standardization of, of prior studies, and that's really a problem. And of course, as you can see here, this this work by Alexander Flett and his group really does highlight to us that if you use different thresholds, you're going to have different ways in which you can look at this. And you can see here that um, the standard deviations are really different when it comes to, from one method to another. So again, this brought us in the midst of a controversy, whether I like it or not, um, about how we should change the guidelines, because now with the, uh, with the SCMR uh, guidelines, the um, guidelines tend to be more standard deviation based. In our, in our 
position on this is to really go ahead and change this into the full attack maximum, which gives us a better idea of the entire myocardium. And I think that that's really the method that needs to go forth with stem cell therapy studies. Now, going back to the Scipio data, again, showing you um, what we saw, uh, both using um, the manual delineation and the full with half maximum, we're seeing a very nice reduction in, um, in scar size at both four and 12 months. Mind you, this was only the treated patients um, that were analyzed in the study. And as you can see here, if we look at um, just the um, change in just in absolute grams, that was in percentage. But if you just look at in change in grams, if you have in general 32.6 percent, uh, 32.6 grams of tissue, that decreased uh, 7.8 grams at, at four months, and that was not only sustained but actually went over some uh, in 12 months as well. So these are very promising data that really give us an idea that this is really uh, a promising um, uh, study and a, a promising therapy. I want to go ahead and, and, and again have you guys look at one issue, and I think this is where I'm going to stop with mechanism number three. If you look at this, look at what happens to the scar at pre and post, and this become was sort of a uniform um, um, phenomenon throughout the whole study, what you're seeing is regression from the outside in. What you're seeing is that here, uh, you're seeing more of the black or as in more tissue that seems to be more normal in intensity, whereas you're seeing more um, infarct endocardially. So this is in line with some of the animal data that Dr. Bowley's group has uh, really come up with. And that's at seven days after, the, uh, after having a, um, an acute MI, these patients went after every, sorry, after a 30-day uh, uh, old infarction, uh, these patients of these animals went ahead and had uh, progenitor cells that were injected. And what I wanted to go ahead and highlight to you is this here, is if you really take a look, you're seeing sort of a similar phenomenon in that you're seeing that the cells and the brightness of the cells are really bright around the periphery, whereas in the middle there, you're not really seeing a whole lot of infiltration. So the issue, I think, in terms of this is that we think at this point that the cells work from the outside in and that stem cells adhere to that perinfarct region and cause scar regression from the periphery to the center of the scar. And the perinfarct region, therefore, should play a significant role in efficacy is sort of our, our, our new hypothesis. And this is where we're going to be going forward with this, is really exploiting this idea of what the perinfarct milieu is in each one of these patients, or rather in each one of these infarcts, how we can really guard or really aim therapy toward those regions and even prognosticate in that case. So in summary of the mechanisms, the advanced cardiac imaging modalities are effective and there's a great deal of work in regards to standardization and optimization of the data acquisition. And of course, these modalities may reveal clues that may indeed further the therapeutic value of stem cell therapy for the purpose of cardiac regeneration. So that leaves me with the future. And where does the future, what does the future hold? And this is where I really wanted to highlight the works of the CCTRN. Dr. Boley very eloquently talked about the CCTRN, and I can't begin to tell you what a, a boon it's been for me um, personally. Um, it's perhaps uh, um, a lot of things make me get up in the morning, but the CCTRN is probably in the top three. It is, um, as Dr. Boley you know, mentioned, a very prestigious group of, of, of investigators who've been doing this for the longest time and have really been pioneers in the field, Dr. Boley included. And as you can see, we're keeping pretty good company here. This is a good group of people. It's a very cordial group. It's a group that really wants to further um, the, the work of, of the stem cells and, frankly, has done some of the most groundbreaking methodologic work um, uh, in the field to date. This year at AHA, their work was highly touted as being some of the most rigorous uh, work and perhaps the work that will probably um, and uh, sort of changing paradigms as to how other um, investigators are going to be doing their stem cell studies. But I want to highlight to you what a key and central role that Louisville is playing in this. And I wanted to go ahead and give you an idea. For the site PI, we have Dr. Bowley. He's also the chairman of the Publications Committee. Um, he's also the protocol chair of a, 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 a very nice protocol called Seneca. And Carrie Lenneman has done ex outstanding work in this field in which she's actually gone, gone ahead and helped us because it's a trial that looks at um, the uh, of adriamycin-induced uh, cardiomyopathy and the use of uh, mesenchymal or allogenic uh, uh, mesenchymal stem cells that could potentially help in this case. Um, it's been, I mean, her work has been uh, really uh, groundbreaking in that, in that way. And um, the nice thing about the trial, of course, and I will talk more about it, as there's a whole slide on it, is that it will allow us to really um, highlight a group of patients probably that we don't highlight as much, and that's women. 
because many of the, the majority of patients with adriamycin-induced cardiomyopathy will be women. Um, I'm also, the, as Dr. Bully pointed out, I'm also the PDC chairman for the contract CHF trial, and also I'm, I'm spearheading some of the late-time MR studies, and there's protocol development um, with Matt Keith and other fellows, including uh, Brandon Elmore. In the biorepository, we're playing a role in both the MR core lab and the biorepository as well. In other words, looking at biomarkers and other molecular markers that could be of some help. And Dr. Bertnager's work in this group has been very, very, um, uh, been highly touted, and his input has been invaluable. So we're obviously currently enrolling in the PACE trial, which is this trial that looks at um, uh, the injection of, of aldehyde bright mesenchymal cells um, for the treatment of um, uh, peripheral arterial disease. And we've, I'm very proud to say that we are now number one uh, enrollers in the, in, in the group, but um, that's uh, pretty short-lived, as you know. Um, in terms of the up-and-coming trials, there's the concert uh, CHF trial, which for the first time will use a combination therapy, two types of study um, of cells, both the CKIT positive that will be cardiac derived and mesenchymal cells for the um, for evaluation in chronic heart failure. The Seneca trial I've already mentioned that Carrie Lenneman has worked on, and the CELVAD trial, which has been put together with Dr. Bowling and our heart failure group, which will look at cell time therapy in patients with left ventricular assist devices. The animal data for the combination study is very, very um, promising, and Josh was uh, kind enough to go ahead and get me the slide. But the issue here is that we're looking at um, the uh, you know, post-injection in a patient or with a, in a pig model um, of, uh, of both the combination versus uh, the mesenchymal cells or the secret cells alone. What we're seeing is this very nice um, um, incremental increase in both the in the scar size and in terms of um, uh, and in terms of percentage of the LV mass and absolute scar size, and a greater effect with the combination therapy rather than either cell alone. So we really do think that there's going to be a nice synergistic effect of this. We can talk about the mechanisms, um, and I'd be more than happy to talk about them after the talk, but there's, there's some very interesting work that's being done on the bench that could tell us why that combination may actually be better than either cell alone. The other issue is cell tracking, and the real question is that really come to is, well, how are these cells being tracked? What's going on with these cells after we inject them? Where are they going, and what are they doing? And one of those is uh, one of those uh, hopefully um, ways that we're going to answer that question is using manganese enhanced MRI. And Phil Yang has been very nice in to lend me this slide. But what it's really telling us, is what I want to talk about is that manganese does a very nice job of, of giving us a signal. And what's nice about it is rather than being like gadolinium, it only enters live cells. So it's really giving us a nice idea about viability. And it enters to the L-type calcium channels. So as you can see here, the cells will, will that the manganese will go ahead and, and enter the cell. And the next thing you'll see is, is T1 shortening. In other words, you'll see things that are live be bright and things that aren't so hot um, uh, be uh, not so bright. So it's just the opposite of the gadolinium, if you, if you will. But what's also nice about it is that it can actually help us track the cell, because manganese can now be used to, to, and put into the cell prior to injection, which shouldn't really affect the biologic effect of the cell at all, as opposed to other tra tracers that we've used in the past. And now we can actually see where those cells will reside and whether or not they're alive or, or dead. And as a result of that, what you can see is that um, uh, you, can, you can really pinpoint where those cells are going and actually give us, again, more mechanistic insight as to how these cells are going, where are they going, are they exerting effect from uh, areas outside of where they were injected, and of course, do they have good correlation with if the cells are, are, are housed somewhere, are we seeing greater biologic effect by, just by virtue of the fact that you're seeing more cells there, or is it because there's some paracrine effect? There's a whole lot of stuff that we could go ahead and, and piece together with that. T1, T2 mapping is really great. I think this is another, these are two modalities that will really be of great benefit. As you can see here, this is, again, another late gadolinium uh, enhancement image. But what we can do is actually use um, a little bit more of a, a, perhaps a slightly more sensitive tool called T1 mapping, which allows us to look at the T1 times of in the entire myocardium. And this is perhaps less helpful in a, in, a, in a situation like this where you're seeing a, an actual scar, but probably more helpful when you're seeing more diffuse fibrosis. Most of our patients with chronic ischemic cardiomyopathy are going to have more pockets of fibrosis besides this one little, or besides this one infarct. So it's also nice to see whether or not the cells exert any effect in those areas of fibrosis aside from the infarct area. 
And T2 mapping is kind of cool as well because, again, we talked about this area at risk. We talked about the endemitous changes that could occur. Could these stem cells be causing either, either causing some edema or, and or causing edema regression, uh, which could pretend some idea of what, what the activity is? <coughs> the gray zone is also an important issue. We know, aside from knowing that it's a, a, as we talked about, that this area of sort of heterogeneity, if you will, outside of the core, outside the core infarct, we do know that if you have increased amounts of gray zone, that there's greater ventricular tachyarrhythmias, there's increased mortality and ventricular irritability. And efforts with Scipio are underway right now to look at gray zone as a prognosticator or effect treatment. In other words, if I have a big, thick um, a rim of gray zone, is that allowing the cells to really latch on a little bit better than if I have a, a really faded out, not so significant gray zone? So the last point I want to leave you with is this issue of pacemakers. And this has been a contentious issue, but I wanted to also point out to all of you that if you're going to do a study in patients with chronic ischemic cardiomyopathy, you're going to see pacemakers. And if you're going to see pacemakers, MRI imaging may be a little bit more difficult, but I'm here to tell you that that may, uh, that, that some of those initial thoughts on this are, are now being better vetted in terms, or at least being better fleshed out uh, with, with great clinical studies. So about 50 to 75 percent of patients will develop an indication for MRI over the lifetime of their device, and an estimated 200,000 patients with cardiac devices are denied MRI yearly. This is a evaluation, or at least these are um, studies thus far, looking mostly at, at 1.5 Tesla, um, looking at the, um, doing MRI studies in patients with pacemakers and ICDs. And what we've kind of noted with this pretty large number of patients now, with a series being about 500 Hopkins um, uh, alone, is that we're seeing that there's relative safety uh, with uh, doing MRI in patients with pacemakers and ICDs with the caveat that we restrict those to certain manufacturers and we restrict those to certain dates of, and of course I'll show you some of the algorithmic approaches to this in just a moment. But as you can see here, your images are pretty, pretty darn good, even with that pacemaker. I mean, you're seeing a little bit of an artifact here and here, uh, but uh, for the most part we're really interested in the left ventricle. We always have to worry about where the pacemaker is, and of course if it's a left-sided pacemaker that always becomes a little bit of an issue, particularly if it's over the field of, of the field of view, that always ends up being a little bit of a problem. But if you're in collaboration with the radiologist, you're doddering well, you're reprogramming the device, and you have an EP, EP specialist on board that's going to be monitoring these things, you're actually seeing a very, very low risk of any um, side effects. There's been really no major um, uh, adverse events. What we do see are very, very small, statistically significant, but not clinically significant changes in the amplitudes of what we're seeing with the pacemakers. Some of the sensitivity amplitudes get down a little bit more. But aside from that, or actually sort of increased further, I should say, but the long and the short of it, it's not anything that's clinically relevant thus far. So if this has been a, a nice um, algorithm that's been sort of put out by Dr. Nazarian over at Hopkins, um, and the issue here is that if the pacemaker ICD is, you know, passed in 1998 and 2000 when they actually started housing the, um, the uh, device for electromagnetic uh, stimulation, we actually saw, um, uh, again, like I said, very little um, problems with that. And so I think um, going forward, the FDA uh, will, will go ahead and allow for clinical trials to be done in patients with pacemakers and, um, pacemakers and ICDs as long as the institution is, is comfortable doing them and they have a good amount of experience with them and have been trained accordingly. So in summary of the future, there's newer methods of analysis which will lead themselves to greater mechanistic understanding. The cell tracking studies are very exciting and will give us more in, an idea of what's going on. And while devices have been cumbersome in the past, in the current era, we anticipate them being able to uh, be these patients being able to image and therefore allowing us to see a lot more than we did um, in the past and giving us, again, a greater insight as to what this very exciting emerging therapy has to offer. So I want to go ahead and acknowledge all these people, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the U of L team, our fearless leader, uh, Roberto Boli, and, um, and the entire group, John Lagren, who's been uh, more of a brother and less of a, of a colleague, and of course the entire team uh, that just uh, continues to make uh, outstanding uh, contributions to the field. The, the Brigham and Women's uh, group uh, with Dr. Piero Versa and his um, 
uh, his basic research group. And of course, my imaging friends, uh, Joao Lima, and all of the um, people who've been really, really supportive and helpful in, in getting the data together. But, but I wanted to end this with my ode to Louisville. And um, as Dr. Boley said, it, you know, I never really thought, you know, this has been quite a journey. Um, it's my first grand rounds. I can't, uh, I got to admit to you that it's been kind of an emotional thing. And you kind of take, especially in the, after the week of Thanksgiving, you sort of take stock of what, what you have. Um, and, and what this place has been able to offer. If you told me that this is where I would have ended up, I've read Dr. Boley's papers as a, as a medical student on his work on preconditioning. If you ever told me that I was going to be a faculty member under him, I would be, uh, I'd tell you that you were crazy, but it's, uh, it's a great position to be in. So I, I wanted to go ahead and sort of thank Louisville for everything it's done for me. And of course, along with the mentorship that I've received from, from Dr. Boley, I work with a bunch of guys and gals who are, um, are really good at what they do, and they're just a fantastic bunch to work with, and it's been it's been quite a journey with them. I want to thank Louisville for having these guys, uh, the, the, for that's where they were born, and this is what they call home, and uh, that's been a great. I want to also um, thank the experiences that I've had with the residents thus far. I mean, this is us having Thanksgiving lunch um, this year, um, as you can see, and we ran the list, and they were, they're doing fine. It's good. And of course, the last thing is. Perhaps the greatest joy, or one of the greatest joys, is this happened last night. Um, I got a, I, you know, I got this whole uh, call. At least I, I had these tickets for, uh, for presents. Will call for the game yesterday. This was last night, and I thought, okay, fine. You know, Bully's off going to go see a pope, so I'm sure he just, you know, handed me the ticket. That's great. And next to me is this guy. Uh, this is Mike Jones. Uh, Mike Jones is our first patient that we injected with stem cells. Uh, he's someone I still have a great relationship and I consider him a friend. Um, and I don't think we watched one play of the game. We just talked about other stuff and he's just one of the most erudite, um, nicest guys you'll ever meet. And that's, those are the sort of things that, that get me up in the morning. But this is, this is just, um, this has been really an amazing journey and I hope that, and I can't thank all of you enough for, for making this such a fecund ground for, for, for work. And uh, it just um, uh, motivates me every day. So thank you very much and I'll take any questions. Yeah, yeah. So that's actually, yeah. So, so the question is, can, uh, can we currently uh, do? Um, uh, is the protocol for doing um, cardiac MR with pacemakers available? The answer is yes, because I've, uh, that protocol was brought to us from Hopkins. Um, right now, uh, we've been working with the Jewish legal team to make sure that we have the verbiage ready for the consent form. And once that's done, we'll be uh, we anticipate getting our first one done uh, early next year. In other words, in January. Uh, in hopes that, because they're certainly these imaging uh, modalities are very helpful for the electrophysiologists because they want to look for scar tissue in these foregone um, hearts. And they, if they have intractable VT, it's nice to know where the scar is so they know where to target the therapies. Dr. Stilman. Two questions. First, when you mentioned that the scar had been reduced on average by 9 grams, I think, have you all done histologic studies to see what the scar is like in the other places? Because that would And the second question is after you inject folks with stem cells, what clinical measures are you following? They have reductions in their IEJ classification or yes. blood pressure? Or That's, those are all great questions. So yes, so histologically what we're really seeing, and, and this is, depends on the cell type. In histologic slides what we do see is, is really um, some engraftment of cells, some replacement with normal myocardium uh, and on histological slides. Of course, that's just all animal studies. Um, so no human histologic slides have been, that to my knowledge have been seen thus far. In terms of the in terms of the functional data, that's really where the where the FDA really wants to see the signal. So not only were we able to see a decrease in the NYHA class, and I think those data are available, I'll, I'll show them to you, um, but we also saw a, a de or an improvement by um, the Minnesota Heart Failure Questionnaire. In other words, how are these patients feeling subjectively? And it's not just a hey, how you doing? As the Minnesota Heart Failure Questionnaire is a pretty detailed questionnaire that really hones in on these very important. Um, uh, functional um, questions that really does give us a good idea and has been very well validated in heart failure studies. Um, so we have seen improvements in both those. So I had a, a general question, one that I struggle with in the biomarker field, which is how do you, how do you pick the gold standard? So you know, the example for, that I could use that you know, the gold standard for diagnosing heart attacks was CK and CK and A, and then Reconi came along and it was a lot of that you're going to be better if you're trying to compare it to the gold standard with image. 
imaging, how, how does that play down? I, I said MRI looks like a much better picture than echo, but I would imagine that echo was the gold standard in some point. Yeah. How do you go about that's, and that's, a, that's exactly what we struggle with on a, on a daily basis. I, I think the, right now we have to go with the best modality outside of the thing that you're trying to, to gauge, which is the beneficial effect of the stem cell. So say, for instance, if I have data, either animal or human data, to suggest that a imaging modality gives me the best picture, the best depiction of what's going on in real time in the myocardium, then I probably should be using that modality or using that method. And thus far, MR seems to be the one that really weighs out, whether it comes to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, whether it comes to acute MIs, chronic my uh, myocardial infarctions, um, aortic stenosis. There are a myriad of clinical um, conditions in which cardiac MR has been studied uh, and looking at both function and scar size and comparing that to both histologic slides and other modalities, MR seems to be the one that seems to be most constant. And much of that also has to do with the fact that you probably, for clinical trials, while you're not looking, whether accuracy is one thing or another, but if you're seeing something that has a very tight confidence interval, and so your margin of error or standard of means of error is pretty tight, you're probably looking at your best form at that point. And so that's where, where, where MR has also won out as well. So for clinical trials, to me, that seemed those two metrics, A, the actual what's going on in the myocardium, and B, the, the, the standard mean of error is sort of important things to track. But I'm sure in the biomarker world, you probably use those as well. Thank you very much.